My name is Mia Inoue. I'm uh, an assistant professor of political studies um, here at Bard. And I'm really excited to introduce our next um, speaker, Kali Akuno. Um, Kali is an organizer, an educator, and a writer who writes about human rights and social justice. He is also co-founder and director of Cooperation Jackson, which is an emerging network of worker cooperatives and supporting institutions in Jackson, Mississippi. He served as director of special projects and external funding in the mayoral administration of the late Chokwe Lumumba of Jackson, Mississippi. Um, he is also former co-director of the U US Human Rights Network and served as the executive director of the People's Hurricane Relief Fund based in New Orleans, Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina. He is co-founder of the School of Social Justice and Community Development, a public school serving the academic needs of low-income African-American and Latino communities in Oakland, California. And Kali is also co-editor of the book Jackson Rising, The Struggle for Economic Democracy and Black Self-Determination in Jackson, Mississippi, as well as being author of numerous other articles and pamphlets including the Jackson Cush Plan, the struggle for black self-determination and economic democracy, until we win black labor and liberation in the disposable era, Operation Ghetto Storm, every 28 hours report, and Let Your Motto Be Resistance, a handbook on organizing new African and oppressed communities for self-defense. So please join me in welcoming Kali Akuno. All right, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Call and response. Good afternoon, everybody. All right. Um, so there'll be a, a, a bit of this just in the short period of time um, that I have. And I say short uh, very deliberately because uh, given, I think, the richness of our running 15-year experiment now in Jackson, uh, there is a great deal to share, both in what we got right and what we have done wrong, uh, some of it amazingly wrong, um, and what we've learned from, um, you know, this process, which is still uh, ongoing uh, with all of its <clears throat> kind of twists and turns. Um, so I, I was prepared some notes, coming here, reading everything, trying to get prepared, then I heard the two lectures and just said, basically scrap that. Um, because I think there are some other baseline things and then some, some more practicality things that at least that I would like to share. And now I'm regretting uh, not actually having done a PowerPoint to illustrate some things. So to those of you who were hitting me about the PowerPoint, initially I was saying no. Now I'm like, I'm, I, I apologize, I should have done that. Um, so let me start with a, a couple of things just as some framework so folks just understand, I think, in this context, kind of why I'm here. So I'm originally a California boy uh, from Los Angeles, California, whose uh, parents and grandparents were part of the great exodus from the South to the West in the context of initially World War II. Right, but before that, they were leaving white terror from the South. And that was just a convenient way to get out. So my folks come from uh, four states, basically, and, and another country, if you go back to my grandparents. So uh, Mississippi, where I'm at, and Louisiana, which is the next door neighbor, that is my maternal side. On my paternal side, uh, it's Oklahoma, and Texas via Mexico, okay? Um, and within this, there are very sordid traditions of people practicing communal forms of democracy and decision-making that I think are greatly overlooked, profoundly overlooked in any of, of kind of most of your literature around um, people's assemblies or, or democracy. So I want to break that down because, you know, in, in Jackson, 
um, we have been on a long trajectory around trying to come up with an institution to express power. And I want to introduce that into the conversation. Now, I know it was mentioned, you know, in a couple of different ways by the first two speakers. But I want to be very clear with all of you that the, the Jackson People's Assembly has always been an institution from its very inception about trying to exercise power. Why? Right? In our context, there are two fundamental things that we are trying to abolish the power over, right? The power over us. That is the power of white supremacy and the power of capitalism. As that particularly plays out on black people and the long-term effects that it has on black bodies and black lives. So we always started with a very particular piece of like, you know, we're not just all coming together to be coming together. We're coming together to accomplish a particular thing, how to keep this beast off of our back to the greatest extent possible. And so when you, when you think about, well, what are the, it was brought up, like what are the constraints? Like what are the variables? Who should be included? Why should they be included? Situating this experiment within those two variables, it automatically does a, a level of sorting, if you would, automatically, right, about who's included. Now, it's, we, we operate on anybody who wants to show up has the right to be there. But who we are very intentional to reaching out to are those who, who historically have had no voice and have had no power within the context of Mississippi. And that is nothing that anybody within our context has ever made any excuse for or, or, or apologize for or never have and never will. And what is very specifically trying to do is to, to create a new set of institutions recognizing that the institutions that call themselves democratic actually have never been so, right? Uh, they have served a purpose for a particular community and a particular set of class and racial interests. And that's something that we've been trying to break. So from our vantage point, let me just start. I was saying some fundamentals. I think we need to be very careful in a general sense, particularly you're talking about the United States, but I would say most of the Western Hemisphere at the very least, about characterizing these projects as they've existed the last two or 300 years as democratic. At best, United States and to a certain extent Canada, but other, they're more in fact and in truth in a historical practice, heron folk democracies than they are actual, you know, multiracial, multilateral democracies. And if we aren't particularly clear about that, then we get confused about the nature of the society we live in and, and the power that it is organized to both protect and serve, to use that very deliberately, uh, and what is created to do. And what do I mean by that? So there's, there's a narrative that's out there right now, pretty commonplace in, in some of the mainstream media, that the phenomenon of Trump is an aberration, right? Like this is not what, this is not America. You often hear that on NBC, MSNBC and CNN. Well, I can tell you living in Mississippi for a while, yeah, that's America. And this is what at least portions of it have always been, right? And the rhetoric, the style of organizing, the constituents, the dog whistles, all that kind of stuff, that's very commonplace in many places and has been long before Trump came on the scene. And uh, there's another narrative about uh, uh, that you often hear within this framework about, you know, we've lost our democracy. Well, I sit here I just want you to take a good look at my phenotype and recognize the place of where I situated, you know, from. And the people that I described to you, my grandparents and parents, I want you all to remember a good number of them couldn't vote until 1964. And in some places much later than that. So when you hear all these commentators talk about the bipartisanship of the 30s and the 40s and 50s, bipartisanship amongst who? Right, because some of us wasn't included, who are here and have been here, were never included in that dialogue. 
were never part of the general agree uh, gentleman's agreement except for as property, as something to be presided over, and whose decisions you know, were, were wrestled from our hands and decisions were made for us at our expense. So there's a narrative about this, this thing called democracy that we have to look at. It is an idea which I would argue is correct, but it is a practice that has never been born. And our struggle is to create it, right? And for me, that doesn't start with uh, uh, many of the institutions of the past, save for understanding their faults. So I'm not one who will sit there and tell you, don't read the Constitution or don't read the, the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Men and, or anything else. Read it, but then put it in its historical context, both in the time and in the general principles that they put out that were intended to last beyond that generation to understand where did it fail, why did it fail, and what could be done differently, right? What could be done differently? So in our case, going back to uh, uh, talking about the, the Jackson uh, uh, People's Assembly, let me recount just a little bit of history of how it actually came about. And I'm going to give you the short version, <laughs> and just in the interest of time. I'm going to give you the short version. Now, the precedent for what we would call the People's Assembly, I would actually very organically and deliberately trace back to the early 1960s, particularly some of the organizing work that was being done by the, the, primarily by SNCC, but also by the Southern SNCC, for those of you who don't know, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, but all the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the NAACP. And in Mississippi for about a four year period, those organizations came together in a, in a coalition called COFO, right? The Coalition of Federated Organizations. And it was that particular coalition that did you know, the Freedom Rides and, and the, the legendary uh, organizing of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, where many of us were introduced to Fannie Lou Hamer and other characters like her, other historical figures for the first time, right? It was that coalition of forces. And on how that, most of that got, got based upon was what they used to call the, the community meetings, often in these black churches where folks would come together you know, to voice their opinion and to organize and figure out like, how do we take on this beast? How do we beat it? How do we organize for economic rights? How do we organize for voting rights? How do we protect ourselves against white terror? That was a tradition, that mass meeting tradition. And that, there's a history of that even going back to the, to the early uh, um, uh, days of the reconstruction. That you can, Mississippi at least, you can directly trace from event to persons, to organizations, you can trace down the line. So I would say always very concretely starts with this early 1960 experience. Now it didn't become really concrete and formalized until the late 1980s in the form that you see it and have been you know, hopefully reading about it now. And that initially came together, uh, well let me back up because you gotta understand this context. So Jackson, Mississippi, it's the capital of the state of Mississippi. It's a city somewhere, it's shrinking unfortunately, but it's somewhere right now between 200 and 180,000 people. 80% of whom are black. 50% of whom uh, are registered as, you know, uh, at or below the US, you know, a poverty line for our particular area. So understand both its demographics and its history. But the critical thing about me bringing up the 1980s, Jackson didn't become a majority black city until the 1980s. So it was very late in this kind of transition of the, the latter part of the 20th century where you had cities like Detroit or Baltimore or Akron or um, a lot of cities in the Midwest and the South in particular that became majority black between the 1950s and the 1980s. Jackson was on the tail end of that, even though it's in Mississippi, right, where the, the largest concentration of black people by percentage have been historically and are now. So it was very late, towards the tail end of folks doing this great migration, and folks started to concentrate there because the windows of opportunity in Detroit and Los Angeles and Oakland and Dallas, those started to dry up given the economy of the 1970s and 80s. So folks, instead of leaving the Delta and, and going further out, they left the Delta and they came to Jackson. 
So in the, in the transition of becoming majority black city, it didn't have majority black political representation until the 1990s. And so this initial uh, People's Convention came together in the late 1980s in the context of fighting the very daily uh, Klan rallies that were being organized. And for those of you who may be, who may be born in the 80s or 90s, there was a tremendous upsurge of Klan activity throughout the United States, right, in the late 1970s and the 19, in the, throughout the 1980s. Uh, one of the most culminating things of it, the folks want to, for historical reference, just go look up our next door neighbor, Louisiana, David Duke, who was a state uh, representative who got elected, right? So let's all recall this, that this is, this narrative and this, this politics has been there again. So that was a critical thing. And in, in Jackson, Mississippi at that time, in the late 1980s, the police chief was an open Klan member, the chief of police. And there were two killings uh, one in 1987 of, of members of the community, one in 1988. And uh, the community said they had enough. They launched, launched a campaign to get rid of this police chief. And it was in the context of doing this organizing that just kind of a mass understanding, a mass consciousness emerged. Wait a minute, we are now in the majority. And so uh, we should be running things in a way that we don't have to just run a petition campaign to get the police chief out. We should be running things in a way that we hire the chief of police, you know, through the mayor, the X, Y, and Z, and, and give them the boot. So it was in that context that people first organized what was called a people's convention, right, through, through about a two-year period of organizing. And that people's convention first came together to run a slate of candidates in the 1993 uh, election. Um, that slate of candidates wind up not, some of them won, I think, yeah, a good number of them won. But the one that was kind of the big fish, if you would, that of the mayor seat, and Jackson has a strong person mayor kind of uh, organizing, wherein the, the mayor is the, the primary the objective, and in our case, the city council just primarily manages the budget. There actually is a lot of power. They don't use it effectively, but actually there's a lot of power where you have line item vetoes on things. So that came together, and it was some of the divisions, primarily along class within the black community, that did not allow that coalition to form enough to have a winning block to, ex to actually elect the mayor. Uh, and so that didn't happen until 1997. But this institution began, began to be born, and one of the critical things to learn, so when we first put it together uh, as a convention, it had kind of an inherent weakness, some of which you, you heard earlier. So it was representative, it wasn't direct. And what wind up happening in the course of the 90s because it is a representative kind of experience was that the group would come together in a large like this, you know, hundreds of people come together, kind of make a collective decision, but then it would go back to the organizations and then the organizational leaderships, be it the churches or other civic groups, they would make a decision contrary to what the, the assembly, the group had made, right? In the express of their own interests, or well, we, y'all didn't know X, Y, and Z, or we already made this commitment to X, Y, and Z. So the decisions of the group would often fall apart based upon how it was actually constructed. And that the body that came together, actually over time, we people recognized it was a great exercise in raising people's voices and some, to a degree raising people's expectations, but it, it did not have the power to hold everybody within that assembly accountable to what was said and what was decided on the group. So the next iteration of it, which was born in 2003, that's when it became formally the People's Assembly. And we, and I'm putting we, because by this time I'm organized, I'm, I'm very much in the process. I was a, a witness to some of the earlier stuff, but now directly organizing it in, in the 2000s. And so one of the critical pieces was we want to make it basically, you know, following an old South African or a Zany line, one person, one vote. So anybody who comes in and, and expresses their opinion, that is representing you and you alone. Now that doesn't uh, in any way stop the, the organization of, uh, of groups of, of collective interests that want to come into the assembly and do some things. Right, the, the factions that we heard about earlier, right, that the framers were trying to warn against. Um, 
it doesn't stop that, but it puts some breaks upon the earlier aspect of the practice. So from 2003, I would say roughly to 2009, was one of the golden periods of his execution where this form kind of you know, grew and matured. One of the things that wind up, however, uh, after 2009 became a weakness of how we had organized it was the consistency of the body. The consistency of the body. Because one of the things that wind up happening, and to a certain extent is still happening, what happens if one month there's 200 people that show up, and then the next month 400 people show up? And the 400 people make a decision different than the 200 people that came the month before. What then happens? And this is a real dilemma that we, we face. We've had this from time and time again, right? Is that a group that come together um, primarily a, around a question that is called by a member of the community. So the one to give you a sense of how the assemblies in, in Jackson Fund have been, been called, they've primarily been called around issues. Right, and not from any one particular group, but a person or a group would raise them. Hey, here's the issue. You know, normally in the in the negative, and what I mean by in the negative is the state is trying to impose some new restrictive, taking away the rights of this particular group or of the black community, and folks want to mobilize and pull pull themselves together to figure out how to counter that. Like that is most of what the assemblies have actually been called together for. And that is also a weakness. Because one of the things we've seen consistently break down, remember those two variables I said, the fight against white supremacy and the fight against capitalism, right? And so that's, that tells you kind of what we are against. It doesn't clearly tell you what we're for, right? And, the, and the what we are for, that is where we have seen over the course of the last 10 years, the greatest fragmentation in the breaks, right? Because there's a stated kind of a historical, you know, uh, amongst all classes, genders within the black community, I'm against the terror that's, that's being raised against me, but I don't necessarily agree with my neighbor as to what the solution to that is, right? I just know I just want certain things to stop. And if I can stop that, then just leave the, 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 the kind of it open. But we, we all been to argue, those of us, myself, who've been one of the primary organizers, like this is not just an open space. It's not a top of the rise. There's, there's a precedent. There's certain things that we want to advocate for and, and why. But that is where we've seen some of the breakdown. And then with that 200 to 400 analogy that I brought up, that case example, what we have seen is that a, the, the kind of a small hardcore group, right, is pushing a particular agenda. And then once it becomes clear that that, that agenda may be counter- to certain under agendas. And the, 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 the main thing that you express, there's a class dynamic, it's not exactly equal, but the group that is most um, engaged, if you would, are primarily people who view themselves as entrepreneurs or who are entrepreneurs. And that's for a lot of different reasons and for some things that we didn't particularly factor in. One of the, the, the biggest reasons is they have the most time, right? They have the most time to engage and be involved, right? And we, we've seen some dynamics around this time factor that I would just tell you straight up, however you know, negative it sounds, the assembly is best when it's majority women. When it's majority men, it's, it's, it fractures very easily, right? And, and then where the different interests come up and the, the you know, pushing a particular agenda rather than listening uh, uh, to what each other is saying winds up being a very clear dynamic that you can often tell sometimes just by entering the discussion as to who introduced it and why and where it's going, right? So these are some of the things that we have not totally figured out um, a check or a balance on, like in, within our participation, like we are vividly aware of it now, but how to, to, you know, mitigate against certain things when things, this is elective because there's nobody in all this work that I've told you about. Now, the, the power of this um, 
is that is this institution in its varied forms and its up and down has been the key uh, backbone to why whatever level of kind of radical political expression has come out of Jackson, both in the form of the mayors that we've elected in the form of the city council, some of the things that have happened, this institution has been one of the backbones of it, right? Uh, but even with that, right, there's still a number of different things that you would think, or at least this was one of my assumptions, let me personalize it, I, as much study of all the different things that, that you all uh, read, you know, we, we, we read uh, uh, Hannah's works, many of us who, who were kind of behind the theory, we had read that, uh, many of us were deeply inspired uh, by the Zapatistas to bring some more modern examples, and uh, myself and others went down in the 90s, early 2000s to, to sit and observe and to learn and to try to understand and digest, you know, the difference in their context and ours, but then how the process, you know, work, what the, the, the forms of deliberation, the time that it takes, right, to come to a consensus was something that, that it took me a, a long time to understand and appreciate about what the Zapatistas are doing, um, you know, which is very different than, hey, I need, I got a problem, I need to address it right now or fix it right now or within this election cycle, X, Y, and Z, total different rhythm, total different piece, and it's actually much more effective, but that's, a, that's for another conversation. But how to deal with some of these issues and contradictions, we still haven't figured that out yet. And rather than posing that as a problem, I think there's a beauty to it, right? I think that there's a beauty to it. And I think it rests in some of the different pieces. So we're having the same conversation in our own form and in our own language, but that tension that you all heard earlier between uh, I liked how you expressed it, like democracy, uh, uh, the two of you expressed it, uh, the speakers ex uh, expressed it. Like, what does democracy translate to? Is it the rule, uh, 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 is it the rule of the people, right? Is it people governing or is it people deliberating, right? Like, which one is it? Like, we have that same piece. And the other thing, critical thing to note is, and how we both expressed it and how we viewed it, and this is a, a one difference to bring up, I would be remiss in, in the, not mentioning this, our, uh, throughout most of its history, the People's Assembly has had no direct relationship or sanction by the Jackson Municipal Government. It is always, or at least some elements have always existed as an institution deliberately and consciously outside of the government. Right now, now, when we've always warned people, you have to understand our context as to why this is so uh, a principle to us. And one of the reasons is, particularly this has become much more clear since uh, 2017. Mississippi, even though Mississippi has the largest concentration by percentage of black people, has the largest number of black elected officials than anywhere in the country. So the, 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 how many people know, let me put it this way, where is the greatest concentration of black elected officials? Let me ask you all guys. Hmm? Atlanta, where else? What else people might think? I already gave you the answer, it's Mississippi. <laughs> Right, but this is the astounding thing. Roughly one fourth of all black elected officials in the United States are in Mississippi. To this day, Mississippi remains the poorest state per average, North Dakota and South Dakota and some other places typically give us a run for our money in some of the other Southern states. But Mississippi is always number one, number two, somewhere in, in there. And the thing that we have, we have witnessed now, basically since 64, is that black representational power does not translate to black economic power, right? Absolutely does not. There's another something that has to be done to, to balance out the economic inequities, right? And that this, while it puts some brakes on some of the most repressive things that happen, it has not opened up a liberating space to change that dynamic. So this, the, the, the confluence of where the economic 
and the, and the political or the democratic space come together, there's some serious limitations within both the Mississippi framework, but I would argue the overall American framework, right, where we don't get to, to really deliberate on deep economic questions, right? That is a spear within our context, like the, the, the realm of private ownership it has its own set of laws that are far more sacrosanct and, and precious than anything else that's the, that the Constitution kind of uh, legally kind of, kind of prescribes. And that's one of the deeper things that we have been, been mounting against. But one of the things that come back to this point, in 2017, the Republicans, through gerrymandering, which you heard earlier, they have constructed basically a super, super majority in the state of Mississippi, despite this large black political representation and large black population. So in Mississippi right now, at least on the state level, there is not one Democratic statewide office holder, Democratic Party statewide office holder, not one. Not one. And so we have now been in a situation, like even on a, on a municipal level, uh, and we have our battles and fights, you know, with the mayor and the city council, but despite that, you know, us and other progressive groups, if we wanted to, we could get the city council to pass damn near anything in our local context, right? If I wanted to go tomorrow and say, hey, I want to build a spaceship, I kid you not, I could get them to agree more than likely to build a spaceship. Now, we ain't got no money to fund it, but the, the notion of it, right, and the, the agreement of the political edifice as it is would agree to that. But we don't do that anymore since 2017 because of the supermajority, and what they have taken to do is preventative policy. And what do I mean by that? So, you know, there's been a campaign in Mississippi. I'll just cite one. There's been a campaign in Mississippi to raise the minimum wage, at least in Jackson, but throughout the state, Jackson's where it's been strong, to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. They came in in 2017 with this new supermajority and said no municipality can determine its own wage scale. So in, in, in things that we put forward that weren't even uh, advanced at the level of the city, city council, my, my organization put forward about climate change right, which is something very central that we organize on. Just us talking about it and getting some, some local press invited them in 2018 to come up with a policy that they passed saying that the state of Mississippi will not comply with any UN mandates around the climate, period, right? And they even went so far as to say, if the, if the federal government does it, we won't, we won't comply, right? So setting up these major constitutional pieces. So, we are now very much in the state going back as to give you an, answer, an understanding as to why this kind of outside, inside strategy and game we play, why it's so essential to us in our context. And that is us understanding that the power of the state, at least as it's been expressed there, ultimately is one that's been geared towards repression. And that our power, at least as a community, has to do with building power outside of that, right? To both institute what we want to do, but also protect us against this entity. So we've always had this kind of weird inside outside. We, we try to use the leverage of the state by winning elections for whatever that can grant us to the greatest extent possible, but always recognizing that people power, particularly the, the self-defensive one that we're kind of oriented, that's, that has to be organized outside of that entity. We do not expect the state of Mississippi to offer us any protection or any sanctuary in the long term. Like that is going to require another process, another revolution, in fact, we believe, we would argue, for that to change. And that is ultimately where we're going and we see the People's Assembly is building a way to create democratic subjects. So one of the bylines that we have is that none of us have experienced democracy, so we really don't know how to be democratic subjects. So we are all experimenting this together. We're making this up as we go along. We got us a few documents that, that kind of help us and may guide us, but ultimately that's going to be determined by the people in this community figuring out how we want to work and live and play and, and pray and do all these different things together. So I'll stop there to leave it open to question and answers. Hopefully that provides you with enough kind of a rich context uh, of um, at least in the U.S. context, in a very particular U.S. context,
how some of these ideas, you know, can play out, organize a degree of power uh, with both its strengths and its weaknesses that everybody can build on in practice. Thank you. Check, check. Check, check. Thank you so much for, for those remarks. Um, I have a lot of questions for you, um, but I'll just start with one and then we can open it up to everyone. Um, so I really appreciated you bringing the question of power into this conversation. Um, and it seemed to me that maybe one of the one of the lessons of your work in Jackson for um, like, you know, US-based experiments in participatory democracy, but also, you know, experiments abroad is um, the importance of uh, the organizing that happens outside of these institutions um, to the actual decision-making that happens within them, right? So, um, you, you know, it seems like in Jackson, in, in, in your work in Jackson, you've been engaged in making, um, trying to make democracy for the first time, as you said, you know, um, not necessarily revitalizing democracy, but trying to empower people who've been excluded from democracy in America. And, um, and that that has required, um, in addition to creating institutions like the People's Assembly, creating a whole solidarity economy, right, creating worker-owned co-ops, um, doing a lot of political education, doing a lot of organizing. Um, and, and so um, I wonder, you know, when you, if you think that um, conversations about like things like sortition or citizens' assemblies um, and experiments with those things um, need to, uh, need to take, we need to be more attentive to questions of power and um, and what what you think that that might look like. Short answer is yes, uh, absolutely. Um, one thing I will state um, and make an argument for is that a truly participatory democracy requires another type of social organization economically. The system that we have now does not enable people to be engaged in broad democratic decision, decision making processes. Um, you know, one is just, just leave it at nothing more than just a time factor, right? Uh, most of the folks in my community if they have jobs, and a lot don't. But most of the folks who work in my community, they don't just have one job, they have two in the formal economy. Now, most of the folks in, in our community have to live in some form or fashion in the informal economy. And the informal economy in Jackson is probably actually larger than, than the, the formal economy. No joke, no exaggeration. But working in it does not often afford, particularly some people, uh, time to, to come sit and engage in a two-hour conversation that you're not quite sure what the outcome is going to be, right? Like that kind of is a luxury, you know, for folks to, to come. And the, the piece around the passions that got brought up earlier, you know, the things that really elicit most of the participation are people's passions around a particular issue as it comes up then folks will make the time. And then as those issues kind of get engaged, you know, or, or resolved or moved upon, you'll find people's kind of activity wax and wanes. And we've learned, it's a small community. I mean, it's only, like I said, 180 to 200,000 people. Uh, and it's a, it's a type of place where they're, they're, you know, it's not like, say, like New Orleans, where people might live there for a decade and move on or, you know, even though New Orleans just have a generational piece, Jackson is very much a generational piece. Great grandmother, grandmother, mother, children are all there, typically kind of living 
within a, a common radius or an, even in the same household. Um, you know, and that has a kind of a institutional memory kind of component. So we know just if you don't see necessarily 400 people in one particular assembly doesn't mean that there's no level of community disengagement. Is that the reality folks just may not be that hyped about this particular issue or they may not have the time. So there's other ways through the organizing that we can and do get in contact with people to ascertain kind of where they stand on particular things. But it would be profoundly different equation if everybody had real time in their life to really sit down and deliberate with each other and take the time that I was talking about in the Zapatista context, take the time over a long period of like, let me really think about the implications of this, not only for me, but for my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, and what that's going to mean for the environment and the community going forward. You get a profoundly different decisions, deliberation, and exercise of power if people had that. But that's going to require a new economy. So for us, that's why this solidarity economy piece has been so central to our experiment of trying to create the conditions that will enable a broader democratic practice to, to emerge. Thank you. Um, I want to open it up to other questions. Um, so I can call on folks from the audience here, and then there's also the online audience, so maybe we can go back and forth. Um, and maybe if you can say your, your name um, first and um, where you're coming here from. How about the person in the middle here? Yes. Oh, and do you want to come? Are there mics for questions? OK, great. Here we go. Hi, um, I'm Sophia Arnold. I just have a question about the People's Assembly. I mean, obviously, you, you know it pretty well. You worked with it. You know. um, do you think that it would work with the random sampling technique of sortition? Or do you think it's important to have specific people come and volunteer and come and join? Or do you think that like randomness would apply? Short answer, yes. <laughs> um, and before 2017, there was a variant of it that we were trying to make um, run in a, in a, a particular way that would involve this sortition uh, principle. So one of the, the objectives that we have, and it still remains, it's just kind of been, uh, at least through Cooperation Jackson's effort, kind of taking a back seat, is one of the things that uh, we want to do is to rewrite the charter of the city, right? And to create a human rights charter of the city. And within that human rights charter, right, have a deliberative body that would be, be kind of a jurist body that was mentioned earlier uh, that would in particular monitor and control we emphasize that, control the police, uh, but other institutions as well. Um, and, and for that to work, we said that would, would, it wouldn't only work through an elective piece. If it was truly going to be democratic, you know, it would have to be random. So we had baked that in, you know, into our thinking. Now, we stopped at the level of practice of trying to push it and advocate for it uh, when they got that supermajority. Because the thing that we don't want to, and this is taking a long-term view, right? We don't want to create a situation where negative law or bad law is actually created. Because it's much harder to then undo a bad law than it is to enact something that you want, at least in our context. So I think it would work, you know? And some of the examples uh, that we looked, myself and, and the community that was working on that, we had a body called the, US, the Jackson Human Rights Institute uh, that we used to kind of steward. We traveled to a couple of different places and looked at models in different stages of development. And, and from us, we were, we were pretty much clear, and I think in unison, that, that uh, this would be the way that this particular institution should work to make sure that it was representative. And I, I, I'm pretty confident that that would have gotten us the result that we wanted. Great. Um, how about um, 
Uh, yes, in the sweat with the cardigan. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your um, the historical context and the the unfolding evolution. I've been alive all those years <laughs> watching. Um, I have a question not about Jackson, but because I thought I heard you're from Oakland. Los Angeles, oh, okay. originally. All right. yeah. Well, this may apply because the question through this whole conversation um, about sortition, I live in Richmond, California, which is, for those who don't know Richmond, California, it's where 747 ships were built during the World War II, mm -hmm. and it's a city that's always been deeply poor. It's now um, only 20% white. And its city council is controlled by the something called the Richmond Progressive Alliance, which is really not a formal sortition experience, but it's it's an emergence of a local power structure. And I've been sitting here through this whole conversation as I was reading to ask the question, how do we take the ideas of sortition and seed them in smaller ways, not to change the whole charter of the city, so that we can begin to nurture um, the ideas of sortition against specific problems in communities like those you're talking about in Jackson, or even better in the Richmond or the Oaklands of the country, which doesn't have the Mississippi, the complicated Mississippi history. And while I have the mic, if you don't mind, I want to throw out another question that's related. Some of you might be aware of the extent to which schools, especially schools that are Title I funded, have been insisting for about 20 years on having school site um, school site committees, which are little tastes, I think, of sortition. And Kelly, can you tell me whether I'm on the right track there? Yeah, yeah, that's so right. Would you comment on that? Because as I'm sitting here as a Richmond resident, I'm thinking, and especially bringing Jackson, I'm thinking like we are missing the opportunity. I mean, I love hearing about Paris, and I love hearing about Amsterdam, but we're in our own country. There's a whole opportunity for um, engagement at the local level where we do have um, emergent um, people, organizations, communities that have very diverse and rich, knowledgeable political coalitions that are fairly sophisticated and not trapped by the Mississippi problem. So I, that's the kind of, I don't know whether I have a question so much as throw that into the conversation if you wouldn't mind. Well, I, I would say this, that anyone here or anyone in the audience who's not familiar with what's going on in Richmond should definitely study it. I mean, we have, we've, we've, we've had relations with folks, different organizations in Richmond going back. I mean, we even, um, there was Gail, um, you know, and uh, we got, I got Gail and, and Chokwe to talk. Yeah, I got them to talk um, and, and they were supposed to do some visits. Um, I think she was supposed to come in April, if I remember correctly, um, right before the Jackson Rising Conference, but unfortunately he passed and it never took place. And, and I would definitely encourage everybody to look at it and study. And in some ways, I would just straight up to everybody, I think where Richmond is, is actually in some place leapfrog where, from where we were at, that both the environment has enabled, but I think also um, uh, keeping, uh, in our case, the, the, the kind of alliance, the political group that was doing a lot of pushing together, it fractured itself, right? And, but you guys have been able to kind of keep it together and I think that has kind of gained some things. And I think the, uh, as an outsider looking in, I'm envious because y'all have, you know, the California Constitution, which is profoundly different, which enables a lot more democratic experiments that were already baked into it that Mississippi just does not. Um, so I know I'm looking for big things from y'all to steal, you know, uh, uh, down, to, down the road. Um, but I think, you know, um, Chevron beating that beast is still a major piece that seems that has to be figured out. Uh, uh, and I'm, I may be speaking with some insider knowledge. I lived in Oakland for, uh, and was a teacher in Oakland uh, area for almost a decade. Um, uh, and a lot of friends, you know, I used to run and uh, hang out, organize and stuff in Richmond, you know, uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, and, you know, one of the largest processing plants of Chevron is right there in Richmond, right? So it has a lot of power uh, in that city and in the, and in the region uh, that they've been trying to, 
untangle, unwrap, and I think have had some success at, but still not where I think you're sure where you all want to be. But I think the um, uh, I would encourage um, a referendum process to to create the broad element that you're talking about in Richmond. I think that's within y'all possibility to do. Uh, and I know that there was some talk about that about a year uh, ago. Uh, and the last thing I checked on was, was some land transfer things that were going on there, um, you know, which are also uh, interesting around, you know, some collaboration between some land that's being seeded and, and open dialogue between, you know, some of the black organizers and the indigenous, you know, lonely people trying to figure out how to how to navigate that together. But <clears throat> Um, yeah, <laughs> so I would encourage that. Uh, the school question, uh, by law, you are right. By law, you are absolutely right. I mean, I was a teacher there. Yeah, it's there. It's there, but it's the, the problem with it right now, as you know, like those pro those programs have not been fully funded for a while, right? And and uh, 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 Betsy undermined a lot of that. And I don't, from what I've seen so far, as early on, that's not the number one piece on correcting that within the Biden's agenda. I know that I've seen it somewhere mentioned around there, uh, but you know, this is this is one of those areas where despite all my criticism of just being a real pragmatist in this case, this is why, that this is one of those areas where this 3.5 or this 1.5 trillion, where it would make a world of difference. Because if they really are going to go through the, the early childhood education programs and institution, institutionalizing the way that they're hoping to and that they're talking about, it would be through that program that a lot of that would have to be instituted and then that would open up a lot more space. The, the thing that, that I am concerned about is that those councils then wind up being regulated the same way that the neighborhood councils that HUD did, which were very destructive to a lot of black communities would then be instituted or could down the road be used against the very program and its aim itself. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. It depends on how well we are organized, you know, I think to determine which way that something like that would go. Yeah, let me just offer Roger and um, all of the Bard students the opportunity to come to places like Richmond and come to schools and apply these questions. How would sortition nurture the process in our schools? Because if we had sortition ideas in our schools, my God, what a fabulous way to start building and I, 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 just before we get to the next question, I, I know part of this, there was, there was some warning about, um, a, like the political direction of things relative to, to the creation of people's assemblies, but we have to give that attention because one of the things that the right has done very effectively the last 40 years is start by actually building monopolies at the local level. Like they worked their way up to control of the Supreme Court. That was part of the plan and part of the strategy, but they played a long game to get to where they are now. They played a long game to being able to control, what is it, 34 of the, the 50 state legislatures. Like that wasn't a, the fly by night thing. That, that was planned out, it was organized. I mean, it was well funded, don't get me wrong. Uh, they got money that we liberals and other forces just don't have access to to play this long game. but. Despite that, we have to figure out how to start retaking back a certain level of power and exec executing in a profoundly more radical way. And so don't, under, don't downplay like the school boards and all stuff like that. They're very important. Okay, great. Um, so we have just a few minutes. One more, you, Roger, you think we can do one more question? Okay. Um, so let's go to right here in the, the back with the blue mask. Hi, my name is Dominic. I'm from New Orleans, and I just want to thank you for your speech. Oh. And my uh, question is, uh, do you think sortition can undo a lot of the problems that gerrymandering caused? 
the gerrymandering, you said? Yes, sir. No. <laughs> That's a quick answer. No. If you keep uh, it there, we can take one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, that's a law. I mean, each state is different. Louisiana has some very weird stuff about it, as you know, compared to a lot of other states. But the gerrymandering is a federal process. I mean, it happens locally, but like the census and all the stuff that's tied to it, that's a federal process. And it's very much tied to a, a larger set of reforms that, that this project, if it's going to ever really try to aspire to something, Certain things are going to have to be getting rid of. Getting rid of gerrymandering is one. The electoral college is number is two. Uh, but this whole piece is that you know, in in the United States, the way things are set up, just so folks are clear, it's actual land that holds power, not people. By the way, that the structure is set up, right? Because if it was actually people, you know, New York, Houston, L.A., Chicago. Uh, would have a, a, a lot more representation, a lot more power than they do, but that is negated by the power of, you know, um, like in the Senate and Congress. You know, Mississippi, which barely has 2.5 million people, has as much say, if not more, than all of California in certain senses, right? And so it just doesn't balance out. It's a land piece, which is a design factor of how they built this project. And the, the deeper piece of which I just stayed away from is that there's a, a critical interrogation of the U.S. project itself that has to happen, right? Like the, the including questioning the project itself. This is a settler colonial project. That is what this entity is. Uh, and, you know, on that basis, it was never designed, even with their best thinking, to include everyone who was with, within the bounds of what they captured. Uh, and there are certain ways in which it's just frame, frame that, that would take a whole different piece to undo to get us to where we need to go. And I don't think that, that a little tweak here or there that you're mentioning is going to solve some of those problems. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, there are many more questions, but there's another panel happening right now. Um, I know that Kali is going to be here tomorrow and is doing a um, breakout session at 1.15. Um, on citizen activism, so hopefully people can come if they have if they want to continue the discussion and um, and and keep talking. But thank you so much for being here and for sharing your thoughts. Thank you all.